I recently came across a critique of test room development that I've heard before and often, but don't really understand. I get stuff wrong all of the time, which is exactly why I prefer test room development. Let me explain. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. The critique that I came across was from Artem Zarchenko. Here it is. In it, he says, test room development implies writing tests before writing the code. You write tests to describe the intention behind the system that you want to build, how you expect it to behave. TDD heavily implies that you should know how the system behaves before even implementing it. You should know what you're doing. Most of the time, you don't. All the developers that I know don't know that ahead of time. I don't know that ahead of time. So yeah, okay, I can agree with most of that. I don't think that I agree with it in the way that Artem meant though, because he goes on to say, I don't see test room development as a viable approach in fast evolving systems like the web. Well, first I confess I found it slightly amusing that people writing web code nearly always assume that it's different and unique to writing any other non-web code. It's not that I'm picking on web developers here because back-end developers call me out because their code is special too. So do developers of embedded code, safety critical code, package systems, banking systems, games, and pretty much every other type of code that people write. We're all special cases, and so the recommendations of how to do a better job don't apply to us, is seemingly what they're saying. In the case of test driven development, there are examples of organizations doing it successfully for all of these different types of systems, and many, many more. So maybe the special cases, even if they are sometimes different, aren't so special after all. Actually, reading Artem's stuff, there is a lot that I can agree with. Yes, it is disappointed when pe people take the wrong message. But describing test driven development as pedantic constraints that no engineer can follow is simply and obviously factually incorrect. Because here I am, a software developer who can use the so-called pedantic constraints to my advantage. Even for that apparently tricky form of uh, coding, writing web apps. To be fair, I, I do like have to give credit. I do like a falsifiable statement. And even more so when I get to falsify it. I suppose it depends on the nature of web apps that we're talking about. If your web app doesn't do very much, and so it's mostly about playing with the aesthetics and usability, then yeah, TDD's not lots of help for that part of the problem. But my point is that I want to test the other bits of the system, the, system, the stuff that constructs the models that I may later display, retrieves and stores the information, interacts with the other parts of the system, then I can keep those tests passing so that I can more freely change the parts of the code that, that are focused on the pixel painting and more freely experiment with usability and nice look and feel. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic and Semaphore. All of these companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're interested in excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering in general, please do check out their links in the description below. Actually, I saw Artem's tweet because Kent Beck responded to it on Twitter, and I saw Kent's response first, which naturally I'd recommend. Kent outlines his take on the importance of small steps with a simple example, showing how we can make progress in unplanned incremental ways even when we don't have a grand master plan of the eventual destination. I wanted to pick up on essentially the same point of view as Kent, but from a slightly different angle. This represents a common anti-pattern that seems to me to be at the heart of Artem's post. That is, imagining the code that you will write when you write the test. This is a very common mistake for TDD beginners. Um, they're so used to diving directly into implementation that they can't prevent themselves from doing it even when they're being asked to start somewhere else, in this case by writing a test. So what they do is because they are being nagged by someone like me, a trainer, to start with a test, they imagine the code that they will write and then they write the test to test that imagined code. This has the same failure mode as writing your tests after the code. 
your test will be now be coupled to your implementation, in this case an imaginary implementation. What Kent is talking about in his post is very different to this, this and does not rely on any perfect foresight at all. TDD is a process of dividing the design of our software into a series of small, actually tiny steps that incrementally evolve our software towards more effective, higher quality solutions. This is the real trick, the real skill of test-driven development to learn, a more incremental approach to design. So this is a million miles away from clever developers intuiting perfect solutions before they start. I think that not only that this is a misread of the intent of test-driven development, but actually misses what I think of is probably the most important value that it brings. Test-driven development creates a pressure on us to work in these small steps. In my experience, the more you practice test-driven development, the better you get at reactively steering the design rather than attempting to intuit it from the start. In the long run, this gives us a more effective, more scalable, higher quality approach to design overall, giving us clear feedback on our design choices after each small step. If you'd like to give test room development a try, do check out my free tutorial or maybe even the paid for full, more extensive TDD training course. There's links to both of those in the description below. Test-driven development is a more stable approach for lots of reasons, but one of the ideas that may seem subtle but is deeply important in terms of the stability and effectiveness of this approach is that it keeps our options more open after each small step, which is why, contrary to Artem's assertion and the doubts of the people that say that TDD isn't possible unless we have perfect foresight, TDD works better than the alternatives when exploring new ideas. Let's imagine three ways of designing a system. Big upfront design, which I'm pretty sure Artem's not recommending. An exploratory approach, as he describes it. And TDD, or what I think of as exploratory with tests. In big upfront design, you think really hard, and depending on the scale of the problem, maybe you try to capture your design in some intermediate form so that you can remember all of the detail as you go through the process of thinking really hard and maybe use these models then to explore and evaluate your design choices. In the old days, I used to do an awful lot of this kind of thing. I was actually pretty good at it and built lots of systems this way, but it's pretty limiting overall. People working this way weren't stupid or naive though. They tried to find ways to break the problem down into smaller steps. And we ended up with modeling languages like UML and complex development process frameworks like Rational Unified Process that were meant to help. But I think that the problems with this approach are pretty fundamental and broadly fall into two categories, leaky abstractions and lack of real feedback. The abstraction problem is evident. Our aim is to capture a design. In reality, the design of our code is written in code. So however else we represent our code, formal or not, if we're doing that without the actual code, there's gonna be an abstraction laid on top of it. All abstractions are leaky and diagramming techniques like UML are leaky in several problematic ways. Some ideas are much easier to express in code and some in diagrams. So there can be a huge mismatch in the levels of abstraction between the diagram and the code either way around. So something that looks complex in a diagram may actually be trivial in code. Try writing a for loop in UML. And something that is complex in the code may look easy in a diagram. Both of these are bad if we're trying to make choices about our designs based on pictures and in the absence of real code. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing inherently evil in diagrams. UML is a fine tool for conveying some ideas clearly. But I think it's most effective when used at a very different level of abstraction to code. And it's a big mistake to confuse the two. It's too easy to express an idea in a diagram that is just plain stupid when it comes to the code. The abstraction leaks. The second problem with upfront design is how do we get feedback on the validity of our design? There was a big push through the 1980s and 90s to try and formalize this with more formal diagramming techniques. Defining rules so that the tools could validate the diagrams. This would be our feedback that checked our designs. People were talking a lot in those days about model-driven design, assuming that we would raise the level of abstraction for, for development by using diagrams and then generating the actual code from the pictures. 
problem was this never really worked out very well. It turns out that code as text is remarkably good and flexible at representing ideas. In this case, a picture really isn't worth a thousand words. Code is often more precise and more concise. In general, software demands an annoyingly pedantic level of detail and precision, and it turns out that text is better at that than pictures. Pictures can help us navigate, though, but do a poor job of specifying things in sufficient detail to be reliably executable. Code is often more concise and more accurate representation of what it is that's really going on. Which means that when we come to realise a diagram-based model of a design, we'll often find mismatches at the level of the code. So our design assumptions can easily be wrong until we get to the actual implementation. The next level up from big upfront design like this is Artem's suggestion of a more exploratory approach. He describes it as prototype iterate test. Obviously, I think that testing at the end like this is a big mistake. It misses out on the large part of the value of test-driven development, which is the impact that test-driven development has on the design of our code. I believe that TDD forces us to be the first consumer of our code and so gives us the first and strongest feedback on the quality of our design choices as a result. But as well as missing out on that so valuable feedback on our designs, leaving the testing until you're otherwise finished, also misses out on the defensive value that the tests give you in test driven development and, and so making you more able to iterate. How do you know that your iterations are still working uh, and leading you in a sensible direction if you don't have those tests? Practically, I don't see a lot of difference between Artem's recommended approach and the more classical big upfront design. Because big upfront design never knows how bad your choices are until it's too late. Prototypes are fine. They don't replace test room development though. Its job is something else entirely. I think that Artem's mistake here is another common though understandable one. Seeing test room development as being primarily focused on testing. After all, test is right there in the name. And I agree with him very strongly on the value of tests, and automated tests in particular. But I still think that it is the secondary value of test driven development compared to the impact of TDVD on the development process overall. And specifically in terms of driving better design choices and encouraging us to work in smaller steps. So how does this compare to TDD? Well, Kent Beck's point is a very important one. TDD encourages a more incremental, more evolutionary approach to design, development and testing. We proceed in small steps and usually try to start with what seem like the easiest steps. In my test room development training courses, I often use a coding exercise to add fractions to teach this incremental approach. My first test is usually to begin with a test that adds the simplest possible kind of fraction that I can imagine a whole number, something over one. I don't need to have decided anything at all about my solution at this point. It's obvious that this is a valid question that my code must one day be able to answer, and I'm guessing that this is probably the simplest kind of addition for fractions that we'll ever need, so the implementation will be simple. But even if my guess is wrong at this point, there's no real cost, and my code and test will be really simple. So I can change them easily, playing with the design freely, and once I've made my test pass, I can still change the implementation detail as much as I like without changing the test. All in the secure knowledge that I still need to add integer fractions. And then I haven't broken anything yet. So I'm picking a behavior that I'd like my code to exhibit, but that won't be too challenging and won't demand that I write anything complicated to make it pass. The subtlety that I think non-TDD people often miss is that writing the test is about designing the external interface to your code. The refactoring step is where we design the implementation detail, not the red testing step. This means that we can often play with our design before we have an implementation even. I can and usually do play with the interface of my code at this stage while it's what is probably the simplest state that it will ever be in. A test calling a public API with as yet no working implementation beyond that it compiles, allowing me to quickly and easily play with the public interface to my code from the perspective of a user of it. I can use this to play with my design for essentially zero cost of change. 
This is much easier than building some prototype of the whole thing. Even in this very first test, I can be making decisions before I've decided how any of the implementation needs to work, before I've even begun to think about the details of the problem that I'm solving. I'm certainly going to need a fraction, and so I can start writing that. I can answer questions like, how will my, I represent fractions in my code? How will I create them? How will I compare them? And so on. I've started designing with the only overhead being two or three lines of test code and enough implementation free production code to represent the public interface to the code that I plan to write later. I find this approach to exploration so much more effective than simply thinking hard and trying to solve the problems in my head. Once I have one test in place, I can guess at the next small incremental step and write that. If I don't like how my design looks as it evolves as I try to cope with incrementally more complicated versions of the problem, then I can go back a step or two. Now, better informed and revisit my assumptions from earlier. Or still with tiny, minute fragments of code. No genius level foresight required anywhere here. Merely a slightly more organised, slightly more disciplined, slightly more incremental approach to design. Ultimately, what this gives us is the freedom to design much bigger and more complex things. Because we're always building on something that we know works. Because we tried it. Relying on our tests to supplement our memories and our understanding of the code as the code gets bigger and more complex than we can easily hold in our heads. This is a much more scalable approach. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoy our content here on the Continuous Delivery channel, please do consider supporting us by joining our Patreon community. Thanks to our existing patrons for your ongoing support. It's much appreciated and helps us to continue to make this material. If you'd like to join, check out the link in the description and look at all of the advantages that you can gain by being a Patreon supporter. Thank you and bye-bye.